here we go. So welcome everyone. My name is John Carter and I am with the Riverside Food Systems Alliance and I am so glad to continue on in our series of local food system pioneers. And really we are all gearing up for a conference that we've got coming up, oh my gosh, on Monday, um, March the 21st. And I am so uh, excited to get to have Valerie Beloso from Axion San Diego joining us. And uh, I met you briefly, I think, at one of our pre-conference gatherings yes. a few weeks ago and really, really enjoyed hearing what it was that you're bringing um, to the local foodie ecosystem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're also one of the um, speaker presenters at the upcoming Grow Riverside Conference. Is that correct? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so Valerie, give us a little bit of a background of what is, so what is Axion? So Axion is actually a nonprofit organization and we exist to be able to support entrepreneurs with access to capital. Primarily, we do small business loans and we also offer um, additional business support and resources to, to businesses in, in various industries to help them launch, help them grow, um, ultimately help them get to a level where they can not only be self-sufficient, but also create jobs and really make a social and economic impact in their communities. So it's, it's very fun work. That's for sure. Wow. And you're down from the San Diego is headquartered in San Diego. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, so the organization that I work with is headquartered in San Diego. We've been in San Diego since 1994. And oh, we wow. have recently expanded to adjacent counties. So we lend in San Diego, Imperial, and now Riverside and San Bernardino counties. But what's really wonderful is that we are actually part of a larger network. So for Chuck and NorCal, for example, we have um, our different Axion offices. Our, we have offices that are headquartered in different parts of the country. And one of those offices that's headquartered in New York has an online um, lending platform for any um, entrepreneur who's in an area that's not served by an on the ground Axion office um, can work through, through, through them. So they'd be able to get a loan through their online platform. Um, so Axion's available to everyone in the U S. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So there is, um, I am not from the, the lending industry and, yeah. and, but I do have friends for instance, that are, you know, maybe foodies or they are, you know, they've been experimenting with their garden and they've got this great recipe for something that they, you know, they're, they make it and people, you know, pomegranate jelly, whatever, you know, and they, and then they find out, oh my gosh, people are asking me for this. You know, maybe they start off giving it as gifts yeah. and then they start getting demand. And at what point, I mean, have you worked with people that were in situations like that? Absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. Bakers, um, you name it, many different types of, of um, businesses that maybe, or not necessarily businesses yet, but individuals who might have like a family recipe right oh. that they've been making forever and like you said it's the same it's the same scenario you said that they give it for friends and family they do it for special occasions and are starting to get requests and um don't really know either don't consider themselves on as entrepreneurs and maybe don't recognize that this is a, a, an opportunity for this to be a source of income even though it's obviously a passion and you know, sometimes can start off as a hobby, um, can really be something that can scale and can be really fulfilling, um, not only as um, as a, a type of business, but really to, to bring that beloved product or whatnot to the masses, right? I yeah. love that, especially when people don't view themselves, like I love how you just put that, they don't view themselves as an entrepreneur yeah. or they don't view themselves as, you know, as, as a person, a small business owner who would ever need capital or something. Exactly. Uh, so what do you usually tell people if that's kind of a common scenario? What, what are usually, how do, what, is there a point that people get to where all of a sudden they're like, oh man, I need to get a bigger oven or I need. Yeah. yeah you know, every case is different. And I think, you know, we meet so many people in our outreach at our events at this amazing mm -hmm. conference that's coming up next week, for example, of, People who maybe are just kind of curious about this business thing, but aren't quite sure. Um, and it's really just about 
getting confidence and feeling empowered and mm -hmm. realizing that this is this, this is um, reachable and this is doable, right? And um, and then having organizations that can really support that and Acción is definitely one of those. And so we we really work with um, entrepreneurs at various levels of savviness, various levels of experience um, to provide to meet them where they are and provide them the tools that they need to really get to um, to a point where they're ready to launch or maybe even ready for funding, right? We work with, um, we will have multiple conversations with business owners before they even get to that point where they're ready for funding, right? Because we want to make sure that, they, that, um, that they're on the right track. And so, wow. yeah, it's all so about it's having the tools. So it sounds like you like like oops I'm gonna I hear a little bit of feedback. Um, um, so, so it sounds it like, like you use a lot of the um, the resources that you have to really empower and almost like ensure the success mm -hmm. of the folks that are that you know that can launch and so that they launch successfully. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and I see Chuck's um, message there about the farmers mm -hmm. markets. I think that's a that's a great way in this industry when we're talking about food and farms. Um, that's a that's a farmers markets are one of the the sales channels or the venues that we uh, highly recommend for for these small entrepreneurs that are maybe trying to really test their product, test the market, see what the demand is, tweak their recipe based on that mm -hmm. feedback. The farmers markets are great for that, and luckily in San Diego there are a number of them. And as we are moving into different um, markets. We're starting to learn what those opportunities exist. And so maybe you know also about in Riverside, if there are these opportunities, I would imagine that there are. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of why the Riverside Food Systems Alliance was even created. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first Grow Riverside conference was begun um, out of the Office of Economic Development, really recognizing that Riverside has this protected green belt area. And, yeah. you know, why don't we make it easy for people that want to start businesses yeah. or have, you know, have uh, do something with the orchard land that's there. And so they convened that first conference. Um, I think it was by seed stock, Robert Hero Seed Stock is the this conference. The conferences have been all around the United States, yeah. but three years ago is when it first came to Riverside. And those conversations of the foodies finally got to meet the people that were, you know, that were growing the stuff and and hear the horrible stories of at a farm stand that no one knows about. And we're like, we want to know about that. Oh so, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons why we're so excited to work with the Riverside Food Systems Alliance and are working also with the San Diego Food System Alliance because there's so many opportunities for mm -hmm. entrepreneurship across the, yep. the food supply chain. And um, and we have a lot of experience working with, with businesses throughout in, in all of those you know aspects of it. So we've worked with growers, so we've worked with farms and, and usually mm -hmm. small family farms. So one of the things that I failed to mention earlier on is that the type of lending that we do is is called a micro lending. They're very they're small <laughs> loans. So our loan sizes in San Diego and each Axion member office throughout the country has slightly different parameters, but ours start at three hundred dollars and we lend up to seventy five thousand dollars. So our average loan size hovers within between ten to twelve thousand dollars. So we do a lot of the smaller um, scale, um, you know, businesses. Um, and so when we're talking about farms, it's usually the smaller farm family farms, right? That don't necessarily mm -hmm. need a lot of capital to get that tractor or to, you know, put make the improvements necessary to their land to grow a new crop or to, you know, get some chickens or whatever that might be, right? But we also fund um, businesses that either are, are farmers market vendors that um, are develop are manufacturing some sort of food product, and so we have a, a clients that make you know um, be like bone marrow broth. They make wow. you know caramel <laughs> sauces. Um, you know, you name it, and and then you have you know the restaurants. So you have food trucks, you have restaurants, you have you know your caterers, um, and you know everything in between, and so. Uh, one of the things I'd really like to highlight that is a great um, benefit of um, or resource or partner, I guess, that Acción has to offer any businesses within uh, within this industry, right? 
is our national partnership with Sam Adams. It's called Brewing the American Dream. And it's a, it's a program for food, beverage, and hospitality businesses to um, not only are they a funder of Axion, so we, we are, as a nonprofit have to raise capital, right, to do these loans. So we get some funding from them, but they also provide this um, ecosystem of support to our borrowers that are enrolled in that program, which are really all of our food and beverage businesses. And what that includes is mentoring, that includes, wow. um, and so like if you're, if you have a food product, for example, and you want help with, you know, what are the liabilities uh, regarding packaging, right? So right. what are the FDA regulations and how can I know whether I can say if something's gluten free or if it's organic or whatever, right? So they can help with that. Um, they help, they do um, with our loan clients, provide them with product pairing opportunities. And so... Mm -hmm. The client I mentioned about the caramel sauces, they reached out saying we need, you know, we'd love to do a collaboration product with, you know, with the client, um, utilizing Sam Adams beer. And so this this client called Praline Patisserie is the name of the business, came up with the this uh, craft brew nuts. And so there are these delicious nuts incorporating the Sam Adams beer, and wow. Sam Adams helped with um, promoting and distributing, you know, that 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 product, which really helped to scale the business. Um, and then for all the brewers, nano, micro, home brewers that are, you know, really venturing into doing it as a business, um, they have collaboration beer opportunities. They have a yearly experience ship to go on site in Boston to learn about product sourcing, to learn about sales and distribution, all the, you know, workings of um, uh, within that industry. And so it's a it's a partnership with Acción uh, nationwide, and it provides a lot of publicity opportunities to our clients that are in that program. And so this is a perfect venue to reach, you know, those entrepreneurs and tell them about that opportunity. What a, what great, a great! It's like a. It's like a one-stop shopping, you know, for someone who, like, I like how you said they create something out of like a passion of their heart. It's like they beer, they brew the beer because they love it, and you know, and they're good at it. And it was probably like a hobby, and then to to see that hobby grow into something bigger, and then now you reach that point where you cannot scale, and so you need expertise. And it sounds like that you your partnership brings in not just the capital side of it, but some of that expertise that you know someone is you know, they may not be so great on the social media or the marketing side or the distribution side, yeah. uh, bringing the skill sets that they need to succeed to surround them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really um, part of the Axion way, uh, not only, and I'll add our website on here as well. So right. we do, a lot of what we do is, is providing that support. So we're not just a lender, right? We're not just we're going to give you the loan and say, good luck. <laughs> we mm -hmm. want to make sure that the support is there. And so we work with a number of other nonprofit organizations that are regional resources to help um, entre with, uh, help our clients with um, business planning, pricing, uh, marketing strategies, you know, different areas of their business that they might want additional support, um, which obviously is a win-win. If they get that, if they get that knowledge and that support, they're obviously going to do better with their business. They're going to, you know, have high repayment on their loans. And it, it really is, it just works, uh, works out. And so any questions, we have a lot of people calling the organization to ask questions that may not necessarily have to do with lending or maybe have to do with lending later on, mm -hmm. um, but they got to take those steps to get there. And so we like to, to be well aware of what those uh, resources are locally in addition to our national partnerships so that these entrepreneurs can thrive. Wow. So do you have, um, Valerie, any fun stories of, of some of the clients? I know you said your client base is really diverse, but yeah. do you have one that just kind of like resonated with you or kind of struck your heart and you're like, that was just, it made you just love your job? Almost. I mean, pretty <laughs> much everyone really, because um, micro lending is inherently character based. So it's really looking at the intangible nature of what the business owner is bringing to the table. Um, and obviously that's one of the factors we look at. Maybe we could talk about, you know, what goes into the lending side, but I'll, I'll save great, that yeah. to answer this question first. But um, a couple of uh, clients that come to mind, one is a really popular 
restaurant in San Diego that has had, I really think, national exposure um, is called Carnita Snack Shack. And they, and I may have mentioned this at our community gathering because it's so hard not to think of them. And so when they first launched their business, they came to Axion because they needed additional capital. And, and logically, the first place anybody goes for when they think about loans is their bank. Mm -hmm. And they had, um, and so they did that. And as a startup business, and this is important to note, that's very difficult for a startup business to seek um, to get a, a business loan through a bank. They normally want to see that your business has been in operations for at least two years, that it's profitable and, you know, a certain size and so on. So the great news is that we work so well with our banking partners that the banker they went to refer them to Axion. So they came to our program and all they needed was they have, you know, they call it a snack shack for a reason because it's very small. And as soon as they open their doors, I mean, lines down the sidewalk, they needed to have a place for a sit down, so an outdoor patio. So we did a small loan, maybe eight to $10,000 to build out the patio so that they can really you know, um, facilitate having such a high, you know, customer base. And so it was um, our clients was husband and wife, a chef and them and just maybe a handful of employees. And now they have their on their third location. They have somewhere around maybe 60 employees. The business is obviously generating a ton of money, has done very, very well. And so when you and then they and then they give back, you know, they contribute, they um, participate with many Axion events to really help other entrepreneurs and, and share what they've learned. And um, that's just a great testimony of, of where what we do helps, you know, really these businesses thrive and grow, get to a level where eventually they can maybe get additional mm -hmm. bank financing. But there's a point in time with a lot of businesses that it seems like there are no options. And so I want to say that there are, you know, Axion is definitely one of those. That's Thank wonderful. You. It's like it's almost like that quandary yeah. that uh, preteens yeah. find where you have to have experience to get experience yes. you know, to, to get your first job. And it sounds like a lot of small businesses find themselves in that same spot without yeah. options. So that it sounds yeah. like you guys have, have really honed in yeah. on what that specific uh, yeah. need space, that season is for yeah. businesses. And, and it's, it's different for everybody because it's definitely a challenging period at the startup phase until you get that two years under your belt at, at a minimum. That's, that's one challenge in and of itself. But once you pass that, there's also a point, and it's different in every type of business, where there are growing pains, right? Where maybe cash flow is not keeping up with the demand and the production and how do I get ahead, you know, and, and really grow my business? A lot of times that's where you hear business owners saying, I'm spending too much time working in my business and not on my business strategically. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just a daily grind. And so those are specific um, needs at that point in time, right? So so we really are able to, to support, and, and, and not only through our programs, but through our partnerships as well, help entrepreneurs in different phases in their business. Um, and we see this also, again, with the, some of the farms that we worked with, you know, that have just got the one tractor, had a, the, what, an eighth of an acre and a few chickens and a few crops and now are at, I don't know how many acres they have, um, what was it, maybe six acres and, you know, actual full-time and part-time employees and tremendously, you know, growth in their, not only their chickens, but in their crops and they <laughs> have a restaurant and it's just, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So these are good problems to have, but it's, but yeah. they're problems that bring their, or it, growth brings other opportunities, we'll say. <laughs> to yes, they do, right? Um, more money, more problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it is, it is, um, it can be challenging. And, yeah. and there are, you know, we're talking about lending and we're talking about debt and financing. It's a very intimidating topic. Right. For a lot of people, a lot of people don't want to um, be in debt because as soon as it, when we're talking about earlier about those businesses that aren't quite sure, they don't really feel confident or empowered as a business owner yet. You know, if you don't feel that, then why would you get in debt? You know, because at that point, it makes it real. It makes it well, this this business thing really has to work out because now I owe whoever right. some money for it. Right. And so we, we're very sensitive to the fact, I mean, we do this every single day, but 
But the thought of owing money and the thought of getting into debt or even just going through the process, never having mm -hmm. applied for a loan before, it can be quite intimidating. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd like to kind of share some tips of what um, can it. really help prepare somebody for that. And it's applicable with Axiom, but it's also applicable with, really with any lender. And I, and I think it's important to say this because, you know, I don't encourage debt just for the sake of having debt, right? If you don't have to have a balance on your credit card, don't have a balance on your credit card. But debt is a tool. And it's a tool to get, you know, an education, can get a tool to get some assets or get your business going, right? To, to generate a, a, a revenue for your, for your family, for yourself, or obviously just to contribute to your community. So, so that's where I think the approach should be when it comes to financing. And the, the main things that any lenders are looking for, they're, they're called like the C's of credit. Um, the first thing I would be actually your credit report, right? So your personal credit, um, you know, what your history has been and what your repayment, you know, maybe um, history talks about how responsible you are with meeting your, your monthly obligations mm -hmm. um, is the first thing any lender is going to look at. And banks are obviously going to look at that much in a much more conservative way than a nonprofit lender like Axion will. But there are still certain things that, um, that are important to know. If you're behind on bills, it's unrealistic that someone's going to give you more money, right? If you can't pay the, the accounts you already have. So you want to be current when you apply for a loan. Um, and generally speaking, you know, we want to make sure that based on your current income, you can afford whatever obligations you have at this time. So one of the tools I want to mention um, that I'll put here is a website to, to pull your own credit report for oh, free. Great. Once per year, um, annualcreditreport.com is a great website to get um, your credit report from Experian or Equifax or TransUnion or all three, the three bureaus. And um, and the, the score itself is not free, but if you want to pay for it, it's maybe like 7 or $8. And it's a really rough estimate of what your credit score that a lender is going to pull, what that would look like. But why I like this, this um, website is because the report itself is very thorough. So if you've had some challenges in the past, your account information is on there, the contact for the creditor is on there, so you can call them to clear up maybe something that's a mistake Great. or something that's, you know, needs some sort of like installment plan in place or things like that. So that's a great tool. So first of all, to feel confident before you talk to a lender, check your credit because that'll really help you know what we're going to look at so you don't, you, you know, don't have any surprises, right? And so Axion as a whole, we're very flexible. We don't have um, generally a minimum credit score. Uh, which is for the most part want to see that you're current with your credit and the credit score you do have will determine the loan size and the term and the rate that you qualify for. So if someone has maybe a low 600 credit score, they might potentially get a loan, but it's not going to be at our maximum 75,000, right? So it's all relative to the, the credit profile. I see. So it, it determines your loan size, the rate, and yeah. all, all of those parameters because it's in a way, like you said, that this is a um, it's a risk. You know, it's a risk on on the lender side, and so they want to minimize that. Absolutely, absolutely. And so you'll feel more confident if you know what they're going to see right before before they even pull that report. I think that takes a lot of that sort of uneasiness and maybe intimidation of the process. Um, you know, out of that that initial contact. So, so credit usually determines eligibility. But the next thing that any lender is really uh, keen on is, um, can you afford the loan payment? Right. We don't want to put you in a position or any of our borrowers in a position where the loan is actually a negative thing. Right. It's going to jeopardize their cash flow because they're wanting the loan to pay what should be monthly overhead that they just don't have enough cash flow to pay their employees or pay for whatever monthly expenses. And then it ends up being more of a band aid. And two months later, they've used up the loan funds and now they still have all those monthly mm -hmm. expenses. And on top of that, the loan payment with us, right? So we need to look ahead 
and we need to we're very responsible when it comes to our lending and so if we see them but we're also very flexible when we're considering somebody's true monthly cash flow right so we don't only look at tax returns we can look at tax returns we can look at bank statements we can look at other miscellaneous income, maybe a, a spouse or a family member that can sign on the loan who may not necessarily be a business, like part of the business, we can really look at outside sources of income to make that cash flow stronger, right? Make us feel comfortable that they can comfortably afford that loan payment. So I think those are the two key things. And if there are weaknesses in either of those, then collateral might become more important. Right. Mm -hmm. So having something that can make us um, give you that opportunity or any borrower the opportunity. Right. But in light of certain weaknesses, um, a lender wants to have some sort of protection that in the event you don't pay, we have some sort of recourse to recuperate that money. And where it's important for, for a, 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 a micro lender like us is that we not only do we need to get repaid just for the sake of you know, recuperating the funds, but our loan funds revolve. And so mm -hmm. any losses we sustain is money that couldn't, isn't going to be available to go to another entrepreneur, right? So banks lend on their deposits. We don't, we fundraise for the money and then we work closely with our clients so that they can, you know, be on time with their, with their payments, stay good with their credit and, and recuperate that money to lend it out to other entrepreneurs. Wow. So it really sounds like the level of of um, care and flexibility that you have is very different than what you said, walking into a traditional bank. So if someone has you know, a craft brew idea and they've been home yeah. brewing for a while and they want to grow this, that they they don't have the other options. I mean, really going to a bank, they would just say, where's your two years of success? And yeah. you've got a lot of that, per it sounds a lot of personal, um, you know, uh, you know, care that you're giving in terms of, you know, yeah. weighing factors that you wouldn't typically get in a larger institution. Well, you know, and, and to be fair, we're looking at the same general criteria. It's mm. just the, the, the way that we approach the lending is considerably more flexible, right? So the, a bank's going to look at credit and cash flow and collateral and all of those things, but typically they have a very rigid box that you got to fit in, right? And if you don't fit in the box, then that's where um, it's very challenging. And, you know, mm -hmm. banks need to be conservative for a reason, right? You got to protect your deposits, got to, you know, they have shareholders and so forth. Um, so, so they actually fund organizations like ours. We get a lot of funding from banks. So indirectly, they are providing this, or I guess directly, we wouldn't exist if we didn't have the funding, right? We do get that support um, to be able to not only have the capital to lend, but support to cover our, our operating costs, to be able to do the loans with these flexible parameters that we have. And so that allows us to do these tiny loans that is not are not profitable for loan, for banks to do. And it allows us to take more time to really dig deep to the story the the character of the individual their level of experience their passion their dreams like all of those things right that a bank's business model is not set up for that so so that's where we come in i love that yeah. so um if anyone has any questions for valerie please feel free to either um, drop them into the comments um but i would love to hear a little bit about um grow riverside which is this conference that's coming up i'd love to just chat about that for a moment because this is the third annual grow riverside conference it's going to be held at university of california riverside this year this coming Monday, the conference itself is on Monday, and then the farm tours. I am so excited personally to get to see, yeah. you know, even though I live in the area, I don't know if it's it's probably the same in San Diego where, um, oh, is your alma mater? Oh, that's awesome, yeah. Chuck. <laughs> that's where it's held. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. So UCR, I am learning so much about, you know, the, the world's most diverse citrus collection. I mean, just crazy, crazy things wow. about the, you know, the egg background that we have here. But even to look at, um, oops, uh, 
what are the opportunities? So what would someone expect? For instance, say you are, you know, you've been experimenting with, you know, home gardening or you're, you've been thinking about, you know, maybe subletting, you know, part of your, your land to do some kind of things. What, what would be the kinds of things that you could expect at Grow Riverside or even, you know, running into you there? Yeah, well, there are a number of different features for the conference. Um, one, um, first of all, they'll, they'll be sort of like an exhibitor area with, with a lot of organizations like, like ourselves, you know, are going to be there to provide information that can really help the different stakeholders, right? So if you're looking to get into business, if you're a landowner, yeah, there you go. Yeah, great. yeah it's very wonderful. So, so a great opportunity to get information from the different exhibitors. There's all, there are also breakout sessions. And so there are specific topics that you're interested in. Um, all the information's on the website. Maybe did you put the website on? I'm dropping it as we okay. speak. Perfect. We yeah. Speak. So check go. out all of the breakout sessions. I will be presenting on one of the panels regarding funding options. Um, so that'll be available. And then where we are also playing a big piece into this is that we are actually doing a pop-up loan center at the event. So you think of those pop-up restaurants or pop-up, you know, different events. We're yeah. doing uh, a loan center where we have um, pretty much, you know, all of our lending team coming out to do one-on-one uh, loan consultations. We're able to take applications on the spot um, wow. and identify. So we take the application, we run the credit, we do, you know, uh, that face-to-face meeting, asking a few questions, and we will do pre-approvals for loans up to five thousand. Uh, five thousand dollars and we'll do anything above that of seventy five thousand you can get pre-qualified on the spot and know um really what your strengths and weaknesses are what sort of paperwork what the process looks like and get a jump start on that process so it's a really unique um experience i think to to come to an event have a chance to meet with a lender if nothing else just to learn about you know lending and options and you know, prepare maybe not for now, but for later. But I think that the great thing is if you are ready to jump and you're ready to, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time and I'm just, I'm going to do it. All the resources are here. Well, we're there to, to help out with the funding. I love that. And I think the value of conferences like this are it's really giving that community surrounding people because this entrepreneur thing is so lonely. I would think it would be so terrifying. And, you know, and to know that there are resources, you know, there are people. Yeah. And I, and you're right. I say that a lot that it's very, uh, being in business can be very isolating. And it's, um, and it's important to know what, um, well, it's important to know that you're not alone, right? That there are a lot of organizations that do provide the support and helpful um, information to entrepreneurs at different stages. And um, I saw the question about organizations in Northern California. The website I just listed is for Cameo. Cameo is a California Association for Micro Enterprise Opportunity. Nice. And so all of the micro lenders throughout the state of California are members. So you can go on there. They have a web. They have like a link where you can see their membership, and then you can filter it by micro lenders, and you'll see all the micro lenders throughout the state. So. Wonderful. Thank you for dropping that in. I mean, I think, I think the, the biggest benefit from someone that is, you know, I didn't come from a farm business, but you know, with the, the trend in cleaner eating, for instance, you know, where people are, you know, they have so many friends who've gone, you know, gluten free or are lowering their sugar, whatever it is. And with the, the lack of options, sometimes people are creating their own things, you know, and so I think what a great trend within the whole foodie kind of industry and health and healthy eating, where there are people that are never thought of themselves as entrepreneurs, but because they've been making their own baby food or making their own healthy alternatives, they're realizing, wow, I maybe I could make we need a business out of this. We need more of that. Absolutely. And I know that that's what this Grow Riverside conference is really trying to, you know, um, to encourage. And I know the Riverside Food System Alliance, it's really the mission of what you do. But um, we need it, you know, and that's that's why I love working for Axiom. We've been, I've been here for 10 years. 
And it's um, being able to support those businesses that are doing great work in the community that are providing a, a you know, a, a, a valuable service or um, product, especially like in food deserts or, you know, regions where you grow the food, but then you ship it out. Like we need to keep the food local. So any way that we can support that, we love to do that. I just love that. And I think um, you hit on that with your one of your clients down in um, San Diego with, with the Carnitas stand was the, the creation of jobs. And that is, you know, the number one, you know, I, I you're just hearing people about how hard it is to get jobs or, or, you know, at least getting the job creation side of things. I think people forget that that's that's a gift that um, entrepreneurs are giving to our community. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and, it, and it's nationwide. I mean, small businesses are really Really the economic engine of the of the US you know of, of all of our cities and so just by the sheer volume and also obviously the job that job creation opportunity the the economic contribution you know regionally and locally and so the more that we could do to support small businesses to stay in business to be you know to, to, to start off with a viable you know idea we need to encourage that and we need to really Make sure that we're providing that ecosystem to, to help those businesses be successful, to create those jobs and stay around for a long time. Yeah. Right. And Stop ensure local. their success. Yeah, I was just going to say, ensure their success. Yeah. So uh, is there any um, other, I mean, I love that you've shared that uh, that resource for micro lending up in Northern California. Are there um, any other pieces of wisdom or advice if people are, for instance, maybe not in the Southern California area, and so they don't have a conference like this? Are there other, where would you direct people, you know, for for resources like that? Well, you know, it, I guess it kind of depends. So I obviously the, the website that I gave is not only good for micro lenders, but it's also good for technical assistance providers. And so what that means are nonprofit organizations that specialize in doing free, typically free, one-on-one -on -one business counseling and mentoring. They do a number of workshops and um, trainings on different areas of business. Because the fact of the matter is any entrepreneur we work with they're the experts in their business, right? Mm. They're the experts when it comes to their trade, when it comes to their product, when it comes to whatever it is that they're doing. But it's very difficult to expect those business owners. To, yeah, SCORE is definitely, so Chuck said SCORE. So SCORE is one of those technical assistance providers. Um, and so it's it's important that, that entrepreneurs that are great at what they do can get help with the areas that maybe they're not so great at, right? Especially if you're newer, you may not know much about you want to hire your first employee. What is a, what are HR laws? How do you protect yourself so you're doing things the right way, right? right? Or how do I keep the books so that I can be ready for tax time and not get in trouble with the IRS or anything like that? Or, you know, nobody knows about me. How do I, you know, what kind of marketing strategies can I put in place so people know about my amazing sauce or my amazing whatever it is, right? So those sorts, so, so SCORE, the Small Business Development Centers, um, and Women's Business Centers are all throughout the state, all throughout the country, really. And so um, the Cameo website is one site to see the, same, the, the, the state of California um, organizations, but they have, you know, they're nationwide. So nice. yeah, really great support. I love it. Well, if anyone, um, if anyone has any other questions, or you know, definitely feel free to um, hop on in if you're in a position to do so, or if you have questions for Valerie, um, questions about um, starting businesses, the resources that are available. I've learned a ton, Valerie. I did not realize. I, I think my favorite piece of my, my takeaway is the Sam Adams thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. The, the, you know, being able to bring all of those other resources. I had no idea you guys had partnerships with oh, that, yeah. you know, at that. Oh yeah. It's, it's, and again, thank you so much for the platform to be able to share it. I think it's all just about, you know, sharing these resources, getting, spreading the word, working with organizations and, and, you know, associations that are, 
just as uh, passionate and committed to entrepreneurship as we are. And so thank you so much for inviting me to be here. <laughs> Yeah. So, and so thanks, Chuck. I did have the seat locked. I'm so sorry about that. No, really join. Yeah, it's, it's locked. It's <laughs> open. <laughs> so, so it says, um, Enrique says in Portugal, universities support startups. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think that's yeah. awesome. So Chuck, we'll go ahead. And so you've, I love that, especially with a, uh, hi, Chuck. Welcome. Hi, hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just have to congratulate the plate to both of you. Um, Again, I'm terrible because you have your your you don't you have your business name up there. What was your first name? Oh, you're right, Valerie. Valerie, yeah. just as yeah. a, just as an aside, Valerie, I know that I know that you love action, but also make sure that everybody knows who Valerie is, is because you're more important than action. Okay. Oh. Don, and Don, thank you, thank you very much for having uh, having this this uh, episode. Obviously, obviously, you touched something very dear to my heart because back in 19, 1960, I did what you are all talking about. And and one of the things I realized as a young person that no, nobody will ever go without food. Uh, food right. will always be, be, always be a business that cannot, cannot fail. Only, only people fail. And it's not difficult at all for anyone, regard, regardless of your background, to start providing food for friends and neighbors. Great. What I realized after I started farming uh, is that is that I didn't have any control over my marketing. So I grew I grew the crop and I was subject to the current market conditions. I would my a, a processor would pick up my crop and and, and they would tell me what they're going to pay for it. Well, being a dumb immigrant, I didn't I didn't like that idea. So I uh, decided that well I've got to be got to be in control of these processes. So it's not difficult at all at all. The only thing is you have to be scaled, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't do it farming 300 acres, but I could very well do it farming 20, 20 acres. So a 20 acre truck farm provided my wife, my wife and my large family anything we ever needed, provided my neighbor, neighborhood with good fresh food at a very reasonable price and provided me, that me the highest optimal profit for my time and energy and, ca and capital spent. And, and this is something that people just don't grasp. I had, I had a guy come by, a quarter of an acre of pickling cucumbers netted me every year for 35 years ago, $3,500. A quarter of an acre net profit, profit clean in the bank, $3,500. Nice. So the wag, the, the wag is, and it, it's even better today. I'm talking 35 years ago. Huh. Okay, okay. the wags would come in and say, well, why don't you grow 10 acre, acres? Well, my market within a 30, a 30 mile radius only could handle a quarter of an acre yeah and i'm used to growing larger acreages and of course when i grow larger larger acreages what do i have to do i have to ship i have to process ship and i am and i am now at the mercy of the end market yes so again today what the farmers markets have done and i remember we started one in chico california about five of us growers many years ago nice. the we had the opportunity to take our trucks Saturday, Saturday morning to Chico, California. Uh, we would pick that morning, morning before we went or the night before. The kids would all be out there. They had their little Shetland, Shetland ponies to throw the corn in the burlap sacks. And, <laughs> and, and, and we would go and, and my wife would stay home and run the little fruit stand and the, and the kids would be out there. And I'd come home with eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars, dollars cash wow. in my pocket from a pickup truck full of, full of produce, okay? And again, we're going back to 1980, 1983, 1984, 1985. Uh, uh, the other, and th this is where, Valerie, uh, I, I have been negative towards borrowing because, mm -hmm. because the only trouble I ever had in my life was when the United States Department of Agriculture wanted to, wanted to get in my business and literally provided me all the dope I hope I needed, which was money. <laughs> well, I thought I needed it, which I did. I didn't. Yes. Bottom line was it put me in a severe, severe strain. I ended up not liking my business. I ended up not not doing well, and I ended up going broke. And yeah. you only want to do that once or twice in your twice in your life. Yeah. North, I mean, you understand where I'm coming from. Okay? <laughs> I do. Now, what what I have to say is that you laid it on the line. But one thing I would caution anybody in, in this entrepreneurial mindset, and of course I'm leaning towards food, obviously, girls. But you know, you know, making beer is great. That's food, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and making jams, jams and jellies at home, and baking pies and cakes—that's all food. 
Right. You're never going to go out of business providing good food. We evolved into the restaurant business. Uh, so we took our food, we grew it, and, and then we served it at the same, the same restaurant that night. So people were getting the freshest of fresh, you see. Yeah. Now, one thing, try to grow your business the best possible with your cash flow. Yes. And that, mean, that means you don't go buy me a new pick-me-up truck and you don't go buy me a new, tra new tractor because you had a good year. Exactly. You set aside, you learn to, learn to live on 50% of your net after tax take home income and you invest the other 50% back in your business. Now you'll, you'll still need help, <laughs> Valerie, you'll still need help, right? Every once in a while, Kyle, and it's wonderful to walk in and say, I need some help, but there's a, there's a mentality in this country and I see it on blab startup, startup, startups, you know, Bob, Bob, Hey, the, the, the most successful, successful people I've ever associated with my life started their businesses, built, built them to large facilities, never borrowed a dime. The only, the only thing is you have to be patient. You have to believe in your business and you have to be, have to be willing to apply the energy necessary to get it done. Oh, so yes. oh, again, Valerie, you're very important. Don't misunderstand me. But what I'm seeing is seeing in young people that call me for advice is, well, I have this great idea and here's my, here's my business plan and I need to go out and borrow 50,000. I say BS. Yeah. Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you why don't you scale that down and start today, go out and have a successful job, take that take home pay, put 50% in your pocket to fade your, fade your family and the other 50% invest back in your business. I'm hey. sorry. I, I, I'm not against lending. By the way, I'm, I am in the banking business also. So I'm, I'm, being, I'm being kind of a, a you know. No, Chuck, I was just, I was just going to ask you if you wanted to work for Acción because that's, I was gonna that's say like what we good. say. Yes. No, it's very, no. No, I mentioned you, you said so many things that I wholeheartedly agree with. I talked about um, being responsible with our lending and, and right, that's, right, you know, right. and it takes time, you know, it takes time to really understand um, somebody's business, be their business concept or their current business model if they're already in business, what their true needs are. And when we right. look at the loan request, not only the size, but what they're going to use the money for really being um scrupulous with that right does it make sense can we instead of you know launching your business with like you said a hundred thousand dollar loan to get a restaurant why don't we start off at a farmer's market vet your product refine your menu get your pricing get some people to really you know get a demand and get a following and then scale it up right and it works for some and maybe you know better than than others but i you know i always think it's great to start small and scale than to start big and fail, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, I've never Absolutely. heard that before, but I'm going to coin that term. I like You're, that. You need to. I love, you need to. I love it. In fact, you should. In fact, make it, you know, Valerie, your last name, and use that as your tagline. There we go. I have to share. I, I've shared, shared this story on Blab and a couple other programs. And I'll never forget when I left UCR in 1964, we had started a business, two professors and myself, and it did very well. It afforded me to, you know, I went to college with no loans. I loans. I provided my own income. And I was down in Coachella, Coachella Valley ma managing our end of the business there. And and I just had this itch to start farming. It's stupid, but I had that itch because I always, always grew things as a young person and always enjoyed growing things. So, so I started farming. And again, I grew 10 acres of radish. Does anybody, anybody want to know why I started with 10 acres of radish? Would you like to hear? No I would I'm love to. Tell you I'm anyway. sure you're going to tell okay. us. <laughs> at, that, at that time, at that time, it took it took sixty dollars an acre to grow an acre of radishes, and I happened to have to have six hundred dollars. And radishes come to harvest in twenty eight day, days. So if I'm going to start my first farming venture, what am I going to do? I'm going to do. I'm going to write a check to myself for six hundred dollars. Go buy the seed fertilizer, fertilizer. Borrow the tractor from my neighbor. Right? I didn't buy any equipment. And I and I went down to the coffee shop and begged, borrow, and stole all the information I could get. Get. Well, I noticed my neighbors who grew radishes did it a little different differently than what I thought should be done. So, being very smart and college edu educated, I changed the cultural practice. Wow. I did. I did one one tweak because I believed in myself. Yeah. The average the average average yield was twenty five hundred dozen bunches per acre. Mm. And the average price was 45 cents a dozen bunches, which left the farmer about three cents a dozen dozen bunches. Three times 2,500 is $75. It cost you 60, you made 15, right? 
Yeah. You guys, you guys do, did you do the math there? I did you the math. I'm, trusting you. An I'm acre. trusting you. You, you, <laughs> had, you had 10 acres. I made 150 bucks for the month, which was big wages, guys. I mean, I mean that's big wages, right? Well, I didn't like the way I saw my neighbor's radishes, radishes grow, so I decided to pre-irrigate because radishes only just only take 28 days. So this, what they did is they flood irrigated, and the seeds, seeds at the beginning of the field germinated and were up 12, 14, 15 hours ahead, as ahead of the tail end of the field. And therefore, when you went to harvest, harvest, you lost all those end radishes because you couldn't afford to put the crew back in back in there another day. Okay? Yeah. So I pre-irrigated, and I and I had a perfect level, all germinated the same day and day, and ended up with thirty five hundred dozen. Wow. Now I I picked up free, right? A yeah. A bunch more, much more money. What happened really, I have to tell this part of it. Remember I said the market's 40, it's 45 cents. Well, when my radishes came up, the market was 60. So do the math, the math on that girls. Wow. It, wow. Cost, me 40, it cost me 40, 45 cents, right? I got yes. 60, which is 15 cents, cents multiply 15 cents times 3,500 times 10. So that's how I started my farming career. <laughs> I, I think that you, again, you've touched upon so many important things and that's, Knowing your margins as a business owner is imperative, right? Especially if you mm -hmm. have, if you're growing or if you're selling a product, you know, knowing how much your cost is. Right. If you don't know how much your cost is, you don't know how to adjust either your pricing or your methods, right? You either your your um, your providers or your supply or whatever it is to adjust your cost to, to increase those margins. So everything you just said, I mean, these are pearls of wisdom. I hope everybody. I know I didn't know anything about radishes either, but now we know all about it, right? So I think we're. <laughs> well, but but, but, but here, here's, here's the other side. Here's the here's the other side. I wanted to say one other thing because what you said earlier. Every person that starts is a is a business. Always has to write the end game. How long do you want to be in the business? You have to you have to write the business plan to get out of it. Yeah. Do not do not get fooled fooled into this. I'm talking about a business, not not the entrepreneur mindset. Yeah. But mm. the business. Yep. You know, how long are you going to be there? When do you expect to leave? And how much do you expect to get for that business? And that has to has to be in your main plan. OK, I don't care what the business is, a machine, machine shop, a newspaper. We have a newspaper up in Wisconsin and, you know, we had to do all that, all that stuff. How long do we want to publish a newspaper every week? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, you know, my partner who I hired in 1970, he you know, we're both we're both in our 70s. How long do we want to publish a newspaper? <laughs> Not yeah. forever. I mean, you know, I like to play golf too. Girls, you did a great, a great job. I love this. I, and what? You, and, and Riverside, God love it, love it. My first house was at the foot of Box Springs Mountains. Oh my! And gosh. I leased it. I rented it from Roman Warren, who was who was one of the sheriffs in Riverside County in 1920. And how he got there? Got there? He started Flabob Field. He was a barnstormer after World War, World War One. He oh ran out of God. gas in his airplane and landed right there, right there by the bridge, and that became Flabob Field in Riverside. <laughs> I never heard that story. That's so awesome. <laughs> my, my little one acre, and he built, built. He and his wife hand built their stucco home. It's behind UC, UCR. I can't remember the name of the street because of my memory. And the reason I rented it, it was a two bedroom adobe, real adobe. And, but it had it had a couple of paddocks, and I was into horses, so I would buy and buy and sell horses, train them. I'd buy them for four fifty, no, buy them for seventy five, seventy five, and sell them for four fifty, and that paid for my college education. Sure. I love so it. I it, love it. And I rode, I rode my horses to campus, campus, and they would be hobbled between the physical science and the life science science business. There were only <laughs> nine hundred students there then. You see, nine hundred oh, of us. Oh, we had a ball. Awesome. We had That's so I we may we I may have to schedule a, a, a UCR walk down uh, memory lane blab oh, later. Hey, just hey, I, I I I can I can get a hold of some real reprobates that you don't want to hear. But, <laughs> well, those are the best stories, Chuck. I'll oh, just say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Ladies, I'll talk to you later. Thank bye bye. You All right. So much. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that was awesome. So see what you started, Valerie. That's, <laughs> the that's the character that I'm talking about, right? That's where you really get to see that drive, the experience, the commitment. You know, you can't put that down on paper. But those mm -hmm. are the, those are the clients we work with every day. And I really appreciate that. 
Um, yeah. Thank you sharing everything you just shared. And it was incredibly valuable for everyone listening in. I love it. Thank you, Chuck, for, for jumping in. And I want to uh, be respectful of your time. We're actually coming up on an hour, Valerie. I cannot believe um, it's flown. Um, I but know. I love, I appreciate the insights that you gave for people that are considering starting their cottage business or, or those types of things. You really gave some good um, tips to, you know, think about. And um, I love that self-reflection of being able to be, you know, to have that. You know, I mean, what a perfect, you know, uh, dessert to throw on to our <laughs> well and what Chuck was saying he said I believed in myself right yep. so it's yep. it's not only believing in your concept and all of that but it's really believing in yourself and aligning yourself with people who believe in you as well not yes. only that they that they believe in you but will also challenge you right and give you the tools and ask those hard questions because yep. We don't, you know, like you said, entrepreneurship sometimes is very lonely because you're, you're with your own ideas and, you know, you think you kind of got it straight. And, you know, until you you really share that with somebody who has experience, well, you have those questions posed that can only make it better, right? So I love it. So, yeah, I see. Um, Tweeting Goddess, Samantha, I would love to, if you wanted to hop on in, you're more than welcome. Tweeting Goddess is actually one of the Ireland's uh, premier Twitter educators and just hosted a huge social media conference over in Ireland wow. and understands well the loneliness of being an entrepreneur, but she is one of those folks has that has that same, yeah, oh, yay, she's hopping in. Um, she is one of those same people that have the same vibe, Valerie, that I hear from you, which is empowering. Uh, that is almost like one of, I hear Samantha talk about empowering small businesses all the time with uh, marketing. Yeah, I, hi guys. Hi. Okay. Hey. What time is it there, Samantha? It is 26 minutes oh. after 11 at night. Well, thank you. We've had a busy week here because it's been St. Patrick's Day and lots of people have been out and partying and stuff. But I really, really enjoyed what you were saying there about, um, you know, the passion that your man had. You know, that guy, like, uh, like he had passion. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners have passion, but the important thing I always say, and you know this, Dawn, is like to surround yourself with people who get you yes. and get what you do and understand your determination and yeah. your courage, because yeah. it takes courage to actually go out there and put yourself out there. And I mean, you could like, you know, have your nine to five and get your paycheck every week. Oh, I know. No, I won't do that. I'll actually go and I'll kind of take a gamble on this business yeah. idea and I'll, I don't know when I'll get paid. And, yeah. you know, so, you know, it, it takes risk. a lot of uh, Yeah, risk, absolutely. You know? Courage. It, it's a lot of risk involved with that. And if you don't believe in yourself and if you don't have, uh, you're right, that positive support system, it makes it very difficult. And obviously there are, there are entrepreneurs who, you know, are able to be all odds and believe so much in their self in themselves that they're able to do that. But it, sorry. Yeah, you, but it's great to have that support system. I think women, I think we don't believe in ourselves enough. Yeah. Um, I come across that a lot. And I think that men are much more able to do, say how great they are. Whereas women, if I said to the dog, don't tell me one great thing about you. Oh, we lost your we lost your sound, Samantha. Oh, sorry, is it gone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I hear you. I think that there is. Hi. I think that there is um, a, a un, there is a distinction. I think between female entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs, and and challenges, right? With um, that that each face differently. You know, in general, there are a lot of programs specifically focused on female entrepreneurship because of that, you know, walking in one example is even just walking into like a networking event as a woman, you know, and, and as a, a woman in business, I mean, you really need to sell yourself in the sense of sell your business, get people, you know, to really buy into what you're doing in order to obviously, you know, do well. And so to walk into a networking group where there's a lot of men and women, but usually a lot more men, can be quite intimidating and so there are certain you know nuances and challenges and I think that the more that you know women can support each other in business and the more that men can support you know female entrepreneurship it's only it's a win-win really for everybody 
Yeah, I just, I love that. And I, I just really appreciate that perspective. I look forward to um, seeing you on Monday, uh, Valerie, at the Grow Riverside Conference. And, um, you know, hearing what you have to say, hearing um, all the great speakers that they will have. But really, it's all about those relationships. And it's all about those connections that we get to make that once the conference is over, that's where the real work begins. Yes. Um, yes. And so I, I look forward to, uh, now that I know that there's a resource, I have a lot of friends that are doing some home brewing. Now go. it's like, okay, note to self. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, please send them our way. We'd be happy to help. Thank you so much, Don. I look forward to seeing you on Monday as well. And thanks for everybody that listened in. This is my first time and it was a blast. So thank you.